<laughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, I know this is what you've all been waiting for, the Senate GOP budget. Uh, I'll make some comments here. Uh, Senate Republicans have, are going to produce a budget in the next two years that funds Minnesota's priorities without raising taxes. Uh, we're very proud of the, these targets. Uh, we've taken a few weeks to put it together. It is the beginning. Uh, as each of the committees work through the details, uh, that's the next step. Uh, back in January, we shared our priori priorities with the people of Minnesota with the introductions of Senate files one through five, and you'll see in these priorities that we're, we're focusing on those things. You'll see that mental health grants will be part of this uh, because we wanted to focus on mental health as a priority. You'll see spending on child care as a priority uh, because we want to take care of children making sure and making sure it's more affordable and there's accountability in our child care system. You'll see a, a spending on education that's almost a billion dollars more than where we are today. Uh, and part of that emphasis will be $75 million that we'll put into safe schools. You will see spending on health care increase $1.65 billion over present spending because we know that it's important uh, to take care of the most vulnerable in Minnesota. And you'll see spending on elder care. You saw the last couple of years we've been working on elder care bills. We're going to make sure that that gets done this session. You'll see spending on Greater Minnesota, including money related to broadband. We think that that's very important to continue that for rural Minnesota. And you'll see money for spending on public safety, especially underlining our correction officers and making sure that they are a priority. The last thing I want to emphasize before I turn this over to Senator Rosen is our emphasis on transportation. And it's not just this year's transportation, but what we did two years ago. And so we, we gathered all the different places that we spend money presently on transportation. And the number is $8.19 billion is how much money is available for transportation the next two years. Part of that is another $530 million that comes in because of the sales tax on auto parts that we passed two years ago. So where the governor is saying we should get rid of the sales tax on auto parts, that the half of that that we took, we leave it in place when that generates ongoing $530 million these next two years. And so, the, and the final emphasis I wanted to make on that is we're doing all of these without any tax increases, which means the provider tax goes away. There is no new gas tax increase, no new tab fee increase, no new no sales tax uh, on purchase of vehicles, no increase there, no fee increases, which you see everywhere in the House uh, version and the, and the governor version. And the tax bill itself will be zero. Basically, it's a tax conformity bill that doesn't raise additional taxes. So with that, I'm going to have Senator Rosen lay out a little more detail. Excuse me. Thank you, Senator Gazalka. And hi, I'm Julie Rosen, finance chair, and I'm very, very excited about these targets. These, bu these budget targets reflect a very serious, realistic, and responsible attempt to balance the state priorities with the ability to live within our means. We still remain concerned about the future of the economy in Minnesota and nationally, and this budget reflects those concerns. Commissioner Franz and state, our state economist Colin Bakitas have mentioned the possibility of a softening of the economy and in the, in the near future, in the very near future. So we're about 2% uh, below Annual GDP growth in future years, the month of January, showed collections of $280 million less than expected uh, from income tax collections. And the end of February, we lost 1,300 jobs in Minnesota over the previous 12 months. This is the first time we've lost jobs in 12-month period since 2010. But that concern is frankly not reflected in Governor Waltz or the House Democrats' budgets. Governor Waltz, in his revised budget, just left $6 million on the bottom line in the out years on a, a spending bill of $52 billion. And Governor Waltz raised taxes of $3.1 billion in the next biennium and commits the state to future spending of $49 billion. And he borrows $1.2 billion. 
The House Democrats raised taxes $3.6 billion over the next two years with a $1.6 bonding commitment, and they spend $49.8 billion. These budgets are unsustainable and leave our state in uncertainty. And not that I'm a Debbie Downer, I just want to be responsible and realistic. With that, we will uh, ask, uh, answer any questions. Senator Kazalko, you might have heard earlier today the governor says the provider tax isn't going away, and Senate Republicans know that. And he basically said it's not negotiable. Well, the, 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 the <laughs> legislative branch does negotiate with the governor. That's uh, part of how you get to the end. Uh, but effective uh, with a bill that was passed in 2011, it does go away this year uh, unless we decide to do something different. And uh, we just show that you don't have to have the provider tax continue and pass a balanced budget that actually funds priorities for Minnesota. He said he wouldn't trade it for a corporate tax cut. You're not proposing a corporate tax cut, are you? No, we have. We don't have a corporate pre a tax so cut prepared. So what do you prepared. trade if you give that back? Well, that'll be uh, for future uh, negotiations, but, uh, you know, that, that's a good question. But uh, we are concerned about overall spending. Uh, we have a billion-dollar surplus, uh, but we know that four years from now, uh, at today's dollars, we actually deficit, we're in a deficit. So we have to be very careful that we don't overspend. And we don't think the solution is that you raise taxes over $3 billion, uh, especially, uh, like Senator Rosen said, if, if we actually are moving towards a recession or a downturn, that's the last time that you do those things. He said something else that he said before, which is that this is all sort of, you guys holding on to, say, provider tax as a bargaining chip, as a way he said something about, I know the old adage, you find out what the governor really wants, and you hold that out. Sort of a two-part question. One, is that what y'all are doing? And secondly, are you doing some of that back at him on provider tax? Is he doing it to you on reinsurance? Are we just setting up the end game negotiations? So just broadly, there are, are different positions that both sides take. And so uh, as we work to a solution, which I'm committed to, finishing on time, having a budget that uh, all of Minnesota can be proud of, uh, but there are certainly issues that uh, Republicans are, are, are passionate about that they think are important, and there are other issues that Democrats are passionate about and think are important. And so those collide, and, th and then what do we do about how do we navigate to the finish? Our number one responsibility is, is to pass a two-year budget bill that balances. Uh, you don't have to do that at the federal level, which is why there are trillions in debt. Uh, but in Minnesota, we have to do that. I think that's a good thing, and, and we will continue to work towards that. Again, you're addressing the Social Security tax. What other, and you say families, uh, what other individual income tax uh, cuts are, are in this package or, or are part of this package? So this is the setting the targets. Uh, at this point, uh, each of the chairs and the tax committee will work out what uh, they want to put forward as their, their best possible bill. And so Senator Chamberlain uh, will have more details whenever he wants to release them. And so I'd rather not speak for him or that committee. So will there be individual income tax cuts in this bill? S certainly there's an openness to that. Uh, think about when we conform uh, to the federal government, uh, more money comes into Minnesota, and Senator Chamberlain and, and the rest of the Republicans want to make sure that, uh, that, that we don't uh, collect all of that additional money, but we rather give it out to different places. And so you mentioned Social Security, uh, there could be a middle class tax uh, cut, all kinds of things. But in the end, the tax bill will be zero. Can you, Chair Chamberlain, just address what you would like to see when you have your number, ideal world, you get what you want, what areas would you like to create tax relief? Well, I'm, I'm going to refer back to Senator Kozelka. I'm not going to give any of you our positions and what we're going to do. Uh, what we will do and we will promise is that anything we will do and present will help make people's lives easier and better and relieve some of the burdens and to help uh, start jumpstart this economy for the years to come. Will you tell Minnesotans a tax cut is coming from your caucus? Will, the, will I do what? Will you tell Minnesotans a tax cut or tax relief is coming? We plan on sub substantial tax relief as much as we can get to Minnesotans. You have a number of areas where these are, these are real cuts and spend reductions in spending. Um, let's go through a couple of uh, veterans and military affairs. It's slight, but how, how, can you, how, how can you find cuts in that area? Operations. Yeah, well, part of this, uh, first of all, in some of the numbers, it's, it's difficult to line them up. 
uh, because of uh, things that happened because of forecasted numbers. There could have been one-time money that is no longer there moving forward. And so the numbers are, you know, we either had to say, what are we adding in new dollars or what are we adding total dollars? We chose total dollars because we don't think Minnesotans really realize that on a regular basis, almost every budget is going up substantially. And so that's the direction we chose is so that Minnesotans realize that we actually have significantly more dollars overall that we're spending in, in the Minnesota budget than we did this present budget, if you want. But there, in, in the end, even if it is coming from one-time funds, you're spending less next year than you did, than you are this year, um, for veterans, for uh, the environment, and, and just thematically, I know you can't get into specifics, but how can you, how can you justify that to Minnesota to explain that? Well, it's, it's, that's the point, is it's so, a little bit difficult to explain. Just one example is uh, higher ed. It shows 69, or I believe the number is up. Let's see wherever that number is. $69 million up. Is that right? Yeah, or six, yeah, I don't have my glasses on. But, um, but we're actually uh, aiming towards increasing $100 million of new money, but because of, of, of the forecasted money and how it uh, interplays, we put it out at that number. We had to pick one way or the other. We tried to pick a way that seemed to make the most sense. It was, and so for veterans in particular, we're actually picking a zero dollar, the same thing with commerce and uh, jobs and some of those committees, but some of them go up a little bit or down uh, depending on what the forecasted numbers were. Why does transportation are going to look specifically like? for a cut? What, what, what agencies need to be cut in your mind? Well, the number one area that we need to slow the growth in is health and human services. And so even though you show a substantial increase in over dollars going, uh, dollars going into health and human services, $1.6 billion, uh, we're actually trying to find ways to reduce that spending curve uh, substantially, and that's a reflection in that number in particular. And again, to the numbers, technically it looks like transportation gets a cut here. It looks like $94 million. Can you explain yep. that? Yeah. And that's that... Uh, the interactions with the last forecast, you know, because we're, we're holding it zero except for the fact that we're adding, uh, looking at the money that's coming in from the, the bill we passed two years ago, that's ongoing money, and that's why we wanted to show it that way, because we felt like it was more accurate to what's actually happen, happening. So. Okay, and net spending, 47.6, <coughs> that's the comparable number, is that the right. apples, the apples yep. to the governor? Yep, that's a, the key number I think you want to look right. at. We do. Mm -hmm. so, Senator, along the same line, the governor says that everybody agrees that Minnesota needs to have a good transportation system, and I assume you folks do too. But say why your budget will allow that, will address those needs without a gas tax increase. Yeah, so first of all, that's why we put this chart up. We wanted people to know that we are spending in the next two-year cycle over $8 billion uh, towards transportation. Uh, of which $530 million over the next two years is ongoing money that comes from the sales tax on auto parts that we directed towards that. The second area that we did not talk about is the last two-year cycle, we contributed $500 million in bonding money towards roads and bridges. And I'm open, uh, as a, if we're looking for areas that we're going to compromise with the governor, I'm open towards bonding money that would go again towards transportation. That was the plan for uh, Republicans in the House and Senate, is every two-year cycle we would put in a significant amount, amount of money towards roads and bridges, and if the governor wants to do that, that would be something that we would be open to. But to be clear, does that chart reflect what's already happening under the bill that you passed into law a couple years ago? That's correct. There's, not, there's nothing on top of that as part That's of this correct. proposal? That's correct. There's no new taxes in any area, including transportation, but because of what we did two years ago, which was the first in increase in transportation funding for roads and bridges in over 10 years, that is ongoing money that will continue to flow, not just these two years, but continue forward. But what's the apples to apples between that and the governor's proposal? Uh, do you have the no. comparison? No. I mean, are, are, you, are you spending, he's still spending more in his budget on transportation, correct? A lot more. Right? Uh, uh, what the governor's doing is removing this dollar po uh, amount, he's putting the, the tax on, sales tax on auto parts back into the general fund and then increasing gas tax and the rest of them. And so the exact dollar amount I can't give you today, it's, it is more, uh, but, but I remind people that we are doing more than we ever did starting two years ago moving forward, and, and a lot of people don't remember that. Senator, you, you say you're open to bonding. How, I, 
go from the 1.3 billion no. or 1.5 if, if a substantial no, I, I just, is transferable? I just want to say we're open to transportation bonding money. Uh, we haven't picked that number yet. It has to fit within the resources we have. The bottom line had 77 million, so we could we can do something there as well. Uh, but I'm just saying that would be an area that we would be open to working with the governor on. Do you have a feel for a number? I know Senator Sanjum said he got his target was in the couple hundred million dollar range. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's half a billion, three quarters of a billion uh, doable or possible. As well, well, it really it takes a a supermajority. Well, in both the House and the Senate, which it means the House has to weigh in just as much as we do. House Republicans as well. Uh, so we haven't picked a number, but it wouldn't be the billion-dollar number you mentioned. So. On Health and Human Services, the governor had said he was wondering if you were going to account for the possible repeal of ACA and a major impact that might have on Minnesota. Do you deal with that in the target? No. No, we have not, and that, that's a very real concern that the governor rightly should address is what do we do if that happens. I don't think I've, I saw that in his budget either. I'm not sure. Uh, I know they met earlier today, and they talked about his plan for I always forget what it's called. It's not Minnesota Care for All anymore, but One Care. care. One care. Uh, but I don't think that could even be online until, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I don't think that could even be ready, I believe they said, till 2023, which is why we need to do the reinsurance bill that the Senate passed. It's very important that we add that extra three years. Uh, the keys to that was it, it gave access to more people in Minnesota. It made it more affordable for farmers and small business owners and those that had to buy insurance on the individual market. And without that, we destabilized the market. And so we moved it forward. It doesn't cost the state any more money, but that is something they're holding back that I, I think it, for the, the good of Minnesota, I think they should move forward, especially when they say what they want to do wouldn't even be ready until 2023. We have to have something in between. Does that mean you could do both? Could you, if he gave you reinsurance, could you give him some public option? Definitely not. We, we are. We believe the private sector is where we make, make the uh, uh, solutions here or, or solve it. I'm asking uh, the Senate in particular, both Democrats and Republicans, let's let's be the ones that actually solve the health care uh, issue, not for just Minnesota, but let's be an example again around the country. Uh, it, before Obamacare, Minnesota led the way. I mean, we, we covered everything. We had people... Uh, kids at age, age 25 could be on the plan. That was Obamacare was 26. If you were uninsurable, you got insurance in Minnesota, which is a commitment we will continue to. But we're going to have changes, and how do we how do we point in the right direction? And I want Minnesota to lead. So the along the same line, if I could just follow up on Mary's question. Yep. The provider tax, possibly some way, shape, or form. If the oh, oh, there hey. Uh, you Mary Mary Poro, Poro, yeah. Somebody yeah. did it. I guess it's my fault. Mary Poro. Jan, we lost <laughs> our key lighting too. Don't talk. <laughs> there you go. Okay, now you're good. Are we going to get Mary? It looks really good. Okay. It wasn't me. It's all right. You want to ask Rara? So, so anyway, sir, um, provider tax, um, a possibility uh, if reinsurance is used as a bridge. No, today we want to just present our, our budget, that uh, we, we want people to be aware that we have to be careful about how we spend money, uh, that we can spend a budget that doesn't raise taxes, that allows the sick tax or provider tax to go away. Uh, the governor is in a much different place than that. Uh, that will make negotiations difficult, uh, but not impossible, and that's the part we just have to wait and see uh, what, what uh, transcribes as we move forward. I'm going to rely on my chairs in particular to work with the governor's commissioners in the House to see where we go, but uh, that's the next step. Right now we want to say this is where we are and what we can do and that it works and that it's good for Minnesota and shows the things that are a priority, I think, to Minnesota we're focusing on. Senator, the governor will probably accuse you guys of making cuts, as he has telegraphed in advance, that yes. he thinks that's what you're doing. What can you say to the people of Minnesota as far as services and, and where, where, they will, where they will be, where the Republicans are on services that Minnesotans use to come up? I, I don't think our budget will show any services that uh, people will... Uh, will will miss or feel. Uh, each committee is going to have to work out the details. Health and Human Services will be the most challenging. Frankly, that's a bipartisan recognition that we have to figure out how to bend that spending curve. Health and Human Services over a two-year cycle is about 18% growth. 
We're trying to slow that down to about 15 percent, 15 percent. So that's, but that'll be the area that will be most challenging. Just the largest change here that I see is state government. What would be, what's the change in that category? It's down 146. Operations. I'll let you address that. Thank you. It's mostly operations and uh, some of the percent increase FTEs um, just adjusting their operations budget. But I also just want to uh, make sure that everybody knows that we really concentrated on things that we felt and we listened to Minnesotans about what's important. And so when you look at an automatic increase in K-12 of $711 million, we're adding so much more onto that. We've committed to K-12, we've committed to higher ed, and we've committed to um, making sure that we do reform and we don't see any reform in the governor's budget. We don't see any cost bending of the cost curves. Uh, we, we see not, nothing about utilizing the dollars better. And you're gonna, when these budgets come out, they, they've been working very hard at making sure they utilize the dollars that we've given them and that the, the taxpayers have given them, that the, we utilize them best for the, the issues that are important to them. Senator, would it be fair to say you're, you're close to the governor and Democrats on the E-12 piece, I think, from what I can tell here. No. Uh, okay, then please, please clarify that. <laughs> well, they, they added an extra, um, I believe, $900 million. I don't have my... Uh, okay, well, we're going to follow what you're... So we, there's an automatic 711 built in, and then we, with school safety, with mental health as being a, a primary, or Senate file number one, actually, and um, a print percent increase on the formula, we have a strong commitment for E-12. To your point there, just in terms of baby steps, how long is it going to take for you guys to get on the same page as to how you're portraying your numbers? They For, for K-12, you, K <laughs> they have 20.5 in the House, and they represent that as a $900 million increase. You have 19.8, and you represent that as a $918 million increase. The public is going to have a trouble following this bouncing ball if you guys aren't even on the same page. So the typical negotiations when you have divided government, which somehow Minnesota likes, uh, it'll probably be early May. You know, that we uh, get to a place where we agree on uh, where we want to be, House Senate governor, uh, and then move forward. And, and the point is we've moved that back. We had a press conference earlier with the governor and the, the speaker talking about the importance of actually trying to get to some of those numbers early because we know that that's just part of it. Uh, once we agreed on Minlars and the $100 million bonding bill earlier this year, it still took uh, at least a week to work out the details. And so... It's good practice for the bigger bills that we're going to have to do, and so that's. But that's what I would guess somewhere are right you, in there. Are you still ahead of schedule, or you know, with only a handful of bills to his desk so far, are you behind? How do you depict where you're at? Uh, we know that uh, the the number of bills that we've done are, as far as submitted, is are on record pace, which is not always the best thing. We also know that the the number of bills that are on the floor uh, to be passed is ahead of schedule. And so I don't I don't think we're way behind. We just picked some some bigger, more important bills that we all agreed on uh, needed to get done. So opioids is in conference committee next January or no, next floor Monday. Uh, thank you. That's what yeah. I meant. Monday. I meant hands free. That's what I meant to say. Is is in conference committee and opioids is going to be Monday. You know, so we're doing a number of the bigger bills that people have have looked to to say these are things we want you to get done. Well, the programs could uh, paid for with the provider tax. Can you speak to those at all? As far as and you said earlier that you didn't want the provider tax, but that you were interested in some of the program. Well, sure. And just in brief. The whole human service budget goes up $3 billion in the biennium we're doing right now, if you count the federal share, which is actually real money. And so we're committed to actually keeping all the important programs intact. Uh, it's going up almost $4 billion in the next coming biennium, an additional $4 billion. I just want to comment on spending $41 billion in the projections. Every niche that's served by Medicaid funding feels broke. And we haven't got enough workers to take care of the people with the severe needs. It is really amazing we can spend that much money and have so little to show for it. So a lot of our work is going to be trying to rearrange where the money goes to focus it so it actually goes to the people with the most severe needs. And we're absolutely committed to protecting pre-existing conditions. We're committed to the seniors. We're committed to the people with disabilities. We're committed to children's mental health and those. And so will that be difficult? That's why you pay us the big money. Thanks. <laughs>
Senator Gazelka, you're proposing the judiciary budget is 2.34. The House combined targets are about 3.6 billion, so that's a big difference. Uh, you've seen what the governor's proposed, they're pretty close. What do you think they're going to have to live without? You're committed to the corrections officers. What will they have to live without in your budget? We're going to work with uh, Senator Limmer to make sure that we get uh, the best possible budget. Uh, I, there, we'll see where that one is as we work with the governor and, and the House. Um, so this is our target that we're, we've asked him to work within. Uh, it's up to him to figure that out, but we know that we want to emphasize the corrections. Got time for one or two more, guys. Senator, the transportation is coming from what would generally be considered general fund money now. How much of that's coming from general fund? Do you know? I, I don't, what was the question? How much of the new transportation spending is from general fund? Oh, all, the, all the new. All, the all of our new transportation, the $530 million, was sales tax on auto parts. That's the new money that came that's directly towards roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. yep. Senator, Senator Governor Wall, set up the end last for one. Us here. You said earlier that on health and human services it was difficult, not impossible. How does that apply to the big picture on closing down this budget and avoiding a special session <clears> and a government shutdown? Well, part of it is the groundwork that the governor and myself and the speaker have, have laid out. Uh, we are working together. We communicate on a weekly basis. You can, I think, publicly you can see that it's been respectful. Our chairs are meeting with the commissioners. Uh, the commissioners are making an effort to reach out. That is important. That, always, that wasn't always there in the past. Those are all the groundwork so that as we work towards the end, uh, it goes through a funnel and down to a, a narrow place that we have to figure it out. Uh, but we've set the groundwork up and, and the dates of trying to get things early. It's never easy. It won't be easy this time. There's going to be a lot of stuff that both sides want that in the end is not going to happen. But what will happen is we'll, we'll pass a good, balanced budget that Minnesota can be proud of. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>
Nick. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Susan Kent, uh, Assistant DFL Leader in the Senate, uh, and uh, pleased to be here today to talk some reality about our budget for our state and uh, the numbers that we've just heard, and to talk about what Minnesotans tell us they really want, and to talk about how we move forward. Um, this is another example, I think, similar to as we've seen in recent years of some accounting gimmicks and some fuzzy math. Uh, it's not uh, presenting a realistic picture of where we are right now, where our state is going, and, uh, and preparing to provide the services that Minnesotans deserve. Um, as we talk to our constituents, as we've knocked on doors, uh, we hear over and over again, they're making themselves clear. They want us to work together to build the state that Minnesotans deserve with high quality education, affordable and accessible health care, and increasing support for working families. And unfortunately, and these numbers just came out, we've all seen them for the first time, so we'll all be crunching them over the next few hours and days. But from what we can tell and based on history, uh, today's Senate Republican budget numbers ignore these Minnesota values. We have two options. We can focus on the things that Minnesotans have said that they want and invest in education, health care, and community prosperity, or we can take the Senate Republican path and refuse to work together to build the state that Minnesotans deserve. Senator Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, you know, I've just had a chance to look at the numbers, but uh, I'm really struck by a couple things. First of all, uh, watching the legislature kick the can down the road is becoming an all too familiar theme that I see. And I see that from what I can tell from my cursory glance at the uh, Republican budget, uh, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, by my math, I don't even see them coming over inflation on their, high, on their education spending. So they're not even keeping up with the cost of doing business for our schools. And we've been uh, really drowning our schools in debt when it comes to providing the basic services they need to be successful and making sure the schools have the money they need. And, and we can simply do better than that. We have to recognize, and when I go door to door to my district and talk to folks at the Capitol here, they're really invested in making sure that our schools are as good as they can be. And right now, the budget as we see presented to us doesn't reflect that. Second, in higher education, we find another problem. They talk about $66 million over base, but that's not even enough to cover the cost of doing business again. And again, we fail our schools and we fail our students and we grow student debt with their budget because the problem we have is we don't prevent the reality of tuition increases in order to pay for our bills. At the same time, on the back side, what do they do? They offer a bill that would freeze tuition. So now you're tying both hands behind the back of our higher education system, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why, as a state, we rank so highly across the board in our country for the quality of life, place to live, place to do business, all that kind of stuff. So I'm really disappointed to see that we're looking at another classic example of kicking the can down the road, not taking responsibility for our priorities of what Minnesota wants, and we're certainly not managing the values that I think are representative of what Minnesota really is about when it comes to education, both K-12 and higher education. Thank you. Uh, hello, folks. I'm uh, Matt Klein, State Senator, DFL from Mendota Heights. You know, nothing could have been more clear in the last election than that Minnesotans wanted us to work towards affordable and high-quality health care for all Minnesotans. Uh, and that's clearly not a part of the Senate GOP priorities today. Uh, despite their uh, suggestion that they are increasing funding for health care, their first initiative out of the gate is to eliminate the health care access fund altogether, uh, which provides close to a billion dollars in healthcare funding for the patients of Minnesota across every part of the state. That elimination has worked well for Minnesota for almost 20 years, and it will cause real harm to my patients to eliminate it immediately. Uh, Minnesotans cried out for a solution to affordable health insurance products, and the governor proposed One Care, a state insurance product that uh, they could purchase. Uh, on the exchange, uh, and this also is not a part of the GOP plan. Uh, so I think we can do better. I think we can move forward with health care that Minnesotans have demanded, but it's clearly not reflected in this budget. Thank you. My name is Senator Melissa France, and I represent Senate District 49, which includes Edina, West Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. And I sit on the tax committee in the Senate, and raising taxes is never easy, and it shouldn't be our first priority. We're not here to defend taxes. We're here to defend the role of state government and that the Republican budget fails to address and to fund. 
State Democrats believe that state should be a partner in providing a great quality of life for all Minnesotans, not just those communities that can afford it. The tax committee targets today reflect our priorities in three main areas, or should reflect our priorities in three main areas, quality of life, economic development, and infrastructure. A zero target from the Republican budget reflects that they do not value livability, jobs, nor safety. And make no mistake, Minnesotans will miss and feel the impact of this budget that fails to invest in them. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Senator Nick Frentz. I represent District 19. And as a greater Minnesota legislator, I'm very disappointed in this budget. And I think my fellow uh, citizens from greater Minnesota will be disappointed, too. We are at a time where the voters made it clear they want state government to help the entire state. Rural broadband, rural mental health, agriculture, these are things that our state depends on and are a bedrock part of our original economy and to this day. Agriculture alone provides over $20 billion of GDP to our state. If we're not sending a message to farmers and the small communities in greater Minnesota, we're simply not doing our job. I look forward to working with Senate Republicans to try to make the agriculture budget, the rural housing budget, the rural mental health budget, all of that make sense. I'm particularly anxious to hear the dollars on rural broadband. On Friday, the governor kept the full $70 million in for rural broadband. And I would just ask those of us who serve the state, what message does it send to a child in rural Minnesota when they do not have high-speed Internet? What are we telling that child about where the places they want to live are? And until we get full border-to-border high-speed access, we will not be one Minnesota. We will not be all together. And I look forward to working towards that. Thank you. Any questions? So several of these budget lines show negatives. Are, are the cuts real or not? You know, commerce, transportation, state government technically shows a decrease in spending. Are, are those cuts? Should we interpret those as cuts? We're juggling because the numbers do have the. Took my sheet. <laughs> we share up here. Um, we are also trying to decipher what these refer to because, as you heard, you know, their emphasis is on bending a spending curve, um, which in many of these areas will ultimately mean some form of cuts in services. So in our schools, for example, we're a growing state. We have more students every single year. Therefore, our budget should grow, grow, increase commensurately. Otherwise, that means there's less funding for the students who are there, right? Um, but they're, they show as if this is... Um, uh, a, a big increase when in reality from what they've said and what we could hear from the initial numbers this won't even keep up with inflation so this means that districts will end up having to do layoffs um, and uh, you know and then ultimately we know what that means that ultimately means more levies for our uh, local property taxpayers so it's I, I'm like I said it looks like accounting gimmicks and fuzzy math to me do you guys have anyone that you've been able to peel off on any of the key issues from the Republican caucus? It's still not a big majority, and whether it's gas taxes, well, start with gas tax and then the uh, reinsurance or health care access fund. Well, they seem to go back and forth on that, on some of these issues. You'll hear somebody say, yes, I can support this, and uh, well, maybe not. Um, I don't know. You know, it is it is a, a consistently moving target, and the reality is, as this process comes and we all see final proposals, that's where we end up deciding how we vote to represent our districts. But um, I do believe when we look at these numbers and, and and the actual programs that will be reflected in their plans, these are going to be some meaningful cuts to what to things that Minnesotans really care about: health care, education, infrastructure. Um, and uh, th that's going to be hard for some of them. And so it will be an interesting conversation over the next, or what is it, eight weeks now? Can I comment on that? Hmm? I got you. <laughs> I think that, you know, having just looked at the numbers, I think what really is frustrating to me is, is on one side it looks like as we take the numbers from 18 and we magically add, like they're adding new money, as if the economy isn't growing, as if our state government doesn't reflect that growth. So that's one part I don't like. But the second part that bothers me is it completely ignores a couple areas we have in our, in our budget that are in crisis situation, such as working with people uh, that have disabilities and making sure their, their care workers are taken care of, such as the dramatic ways in which we have, as, as has been alluded to, uh, cut education and not kept up with the times in terms of how much it costs us to do business, such as the student debt. So what, I, what bothers me, and I talked about it kicking the can down the road, is that we're pretending like that's not the, one of the big issues we're actually facing. 
And so it literally just ignores that. But in, in an effort to do that, it also says to you, look at all this new money we're spending. As if magically they've just increased the budget from the 18 amount and they produced a bunch of new spending. And that's just not accurate. And so I think it's really important that that, that contrast is understood. I, I don't know if we've made that as clear as I'd like, but I really want that contrast to be understood, that, that their presentation isn't like they magically came up with $2.3 billion in new funding. That just isn't how the, the budget works. Where's your majority leader? Minority. Minority. Minority leader, Minority leader, yes. uh, it's one of those busy days and we came down to provide the response. We're all on board with trying to make sure that we have a good budget that reflects uh, Minnesota's values. You guys have been, some of you have been here on, around here a long time. Is there any place that you think the government is doing too much or not doing it right that you would support scaling it back? You know, as I sit on committees and listen well, to stories okay. from people who are doing the work of our government, who are receiving the services of our government. What I hear over and over and over again is that it's harder and harder uh, to keep up and, and to provide those services. I, I'll digress by it for a second and say that I come from the private sector and literally part of my job in the private sector used to be projecting inflation because it's a legitimate cost of doing business. And there is this notion that inflation should not apply in the world of state government. And so we had a bill in transportation the other day that was looking at um, a real challenge within our state troopers and their workforce and their salaries and the fact that they are falling below a lot of our cities. And so it's becoming harder and harder for the state troopers to keep their force. Um, that's a real question. That's also happening across all of our fields. And so um, how we make sure in a time of a workforce shortage that we're maintaining you know, good quality employees doing the work, that we're doing the services, because uh, ultimately that's what this all comes down to. I remember, uh, and I'll, it'll be interesting to see, uh, a couple in the last biennium, you know, there was a big effort, to, I think it was a 14% cut out of revenue in the Department of Revenue at a time when we are facing unprecedented um, uh, hacking and identity theft and fraud efforts when we need people more than ever to be able to pay close attention to those returns and make sure that taxpayer money and refunds are going back as they should. There's never a substantive discussion about actually how these cuts are going to be applied once it matters for, for taxpayers. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Brian, I just wanted to speak to your point. I think we're spending far, far too much in the state of Minnesota on pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're, uh, the drug costs are outrageous. Uh, we've tried to address that at the legislature. We know that Minnesota taxpayer dollars are lining the pockets of uh, corporate executives in the pharmaceutical industry. We need an oversight board and we need a commission that will monitor uh, and adjudicate those prices and return some power of the people uh, to the pricing of pharmaceuticals in this state. That is why Governor Walls has proposed uh, a single administrator for pharmaceuticals here in the state so that we can use our leveraging and negotiating power to bring those costs down. Doctor, can you stay up there? Um, Commissioner Laurie has said getting rid of the provider tax drives a $1.5 billion hole in the middle of his budget. This, if we can learn anything from these lines, and maybe we can't, they add $1.6 billion mm -hmm. to the HHS budget. Any way to know whether that maintains the programs that provider tax was paying for? Do you doubt that? I, mean, I, I severely doubt it, just as you do yourself. I, I don't see how you can eliminate a billion dollars from a budget annually and then project that you're going to increase spending over coming years. I don't know where that billion dollars comes from. And as you mentioned, some of these Republican legislators have been around here longer than I have, so maybe they can find a billion dollars somewhere. But eliminating the Health Care Access Fund uh, will drive a severe hole in the budget and will severely affect the health of Minnesotans. The line item says 1.6 billion plus. In yeah. this, on this sheet? Right. We'll look into that. Hogwarts math. Yeah. What'd you yeah. say? Hogwarts math. Do you have to know how much it will increase just on the, the autopilot? Um, just the spending that we're Just the base spending. Oh, okay. Actually, no, and I was thinking about that uh, earlier today, as a matter of fact. I think it would be a very interesting exercise to make sure we have that piece of paper, and we will work on that and get that to you, because that's what matters. Um, and, and that's where it reflects the growing number of students in our schools. And so, and that, that is what's missing from the numbers that we've seen today. And you guys are asking the right questions, and I encourage you to continue asking those questions, because um, this, this looks lovely, except it's just not a realistic picture. Savings to be found in rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, 
there is, we always need to be on guard to make sure that we are protecting every taxpayer dollar and avoiding waste, fraud, and abuse. Absolutely. Do I think that it is some significant bucket out there that we can go discover and solve all our problems? Absolutely not. Um, you know, again, what we hear over and over again from um, agencies, departments, different programs, our schools, our infrastructure, um, they're, they're barely able to do what they're doing with the resources they have available. I think that if they knew that there was a pile of money in a closet someplace, they'd find it and they'd figure out a way to put it to work. Uh, just to jump in, the, the answer to the question is there's not a legislator up here that wouldn't like to reduce fraud and waste. The way to show the fraud and waste is to identify it, to bring it to committee, have a majority of the committee members say that's fraud and waste, put a price tag on it, bring it to the floor and get it passed. When you set a target that says we're going to cut, just as an example, transportation spending $94 million, uh, you're saying I'm not identifying fraud and waste, I'm not specifically telling you what we're going to cut, just go cut it. And that's where the trouble starts, mm -hmm. is you start setting a target that says you will meet this whether you identify fraud and waste or not. And so to answer both those questions, every legislator here and every party is willing to eliminate fraud and waste wherever we find it. Uh, the problem comes in when you say, well, I've decided in the target how much fraud and waste there is, and so go reduce it. And that's what creates difficulties. And uh, on a slightly different note, four of the five of us here serve on the Senate Transportation Committee, and there's plenty of room for discussion on the transportation budget. Minnesota roads are given a D plus by the American Society of Civil Engineers. It doesn't look to me like that's a priority for my friends across the aisle in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.